right, so we've all heard a lot about generative art. It's in all the headlines. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about AI-generated art, but I'm not gonna be talking to you about how much better the models have gotten over the past six months, or even what it's going to do to society, which I know we're all really concerned about. I'm actually gonna be talking about how we interact with this art. So we can think about art as being kind of good, solid art. There's the Mona Lisa, it has physical form. I can buy copies of it, but even the copies are just something I can hold in my hand. They're in a physical location. They were made by a person. And I can participate in this too. I can say, okay, well, I've made it a piece of art. Maybe it's not as good, but I'm still participating in this tradition of making art. So now we've got AIs that make art as well. That's neat, all right, an AI has also made a piece of solid art. So I'm like, all right, good job, AI. Now the AI keeps making art, and I start to feel a little anxious, right? Because now the AI is making art faster than I'm making art. It's making the same kind of art, but faster. And it keeps making art, because one of the interesting things about computers is that once they do something once, they can keep doing that thing over and over and over again. So I'm starting to get pretty alarmed right now. And the AI just keeps making art. But something really interesting happens at this moment. Notice how your eyes stop seeing individual pieces of art. You start seeing kind of this big sea of art. You start seeing this art as a space. And I actually find this weirdly comforting. I don't feel like I'm competing anymore with this space of art. I don't feel like we're kind of doing the same thing, but now it's better. And we can look at headlines and start to notice something interesting about them. When we talk about AI art, we talk about we're being flooded with it. There's a massive wave deluging us. We're being submerged by all of this art. Now, this is intended as an insult. But we can listen to it as though people are saying what's really on their minds. What's really true about this AI? And we can think, maybe this is actually something meaningful, that they're using all these liquid metaphors, that this isn't solid art anymore. This isn't individual pieces of art. This is a space of liquid art. So this talk is about a different perspective on generative art. Uh, we're thinking about what if this is not just something bigger and scarier? What if this is something different? What if it is a different state of matter, a different state of art than traditional solid art? And if it's different, how are we gonna actually use that? Can we learn how to surf in a space of liquid art? What can we do in this space that we couldn't have done with traditional solid art? So first, a classical moment with J.S. Bach. So a composer that many of us know, I'm sure he's been performed in this very hall. And he wrote 1,128 compositions that we know of. They find more all the time, so he's a busy guy. There's another musician, another composer, David Cope. David Cope spends a couple of decades working on this piece of software uh, called Experiments in Musical Intelligence. He writes it initially to help himself compose, but it also generates its own box style pieces. And he thinks that that's pretty cool. He actually thinks it's so good that he takes one of these pieces and gives it to a Bach scholar and says, if this were a lost Bach piece, do you think it would have come from Bach? He said, yeah, it's you know C minus Bach piece, which is actually pretty good. So, all right, he's got that. And he's got an AI that can now generate Bach. And he thinks this is pretty cool because now he's discovered a liquid space of infinite Bach pieces, as many as you want in any direction. You push the button and out came hundreds and thousands of sonatas. Neat. So he asked an, an orchestra, do you wanna play these? I've, I've composed these with my AI, would you like to play them? And the orchestra says no. And he's wondering like, why is that? And this really insightful quotation of his, because my program was continuing to pump out music like a spigot, it became a problem of why I play this sonata and not that one. Look, again, the liquid metaphor, even back then it's starting up. And so what had happened here was that there is now so much art being generated by this Bach bot that it was no longer a solid space, it was a liquid space. They were being, the orchestras were being overwhelmed by the possibility space. There were so many pieces that they were getting content vertigo, they were being paralyzed by this, they could no longer focus on individual pieces. So Cope did something drastic. He picked out a couple, actually a few thousand, and deleted Amy. So now this bot can no longer make music. Orchestras would now play it. They're like, yay, now it's been compressed from this confusing liquid space back to a nice solid space that we understand. So I coined a term for this called the Bach faucet. So a Bach faucet is a situation that we now find ourselves in where an AI can generate as much as we want of something. We liked the something, we can now have as much of it as we want, 
suddenly it doesn't have value anymore. That's really interesting. Like why is too many of the thing that we already liked now a bad thing? And if you get into a Bach faucet, a lot of people will take the same move that Cope did, which is to compress this liquid space back down into solid. So do we have other options? And I would say yes, because I'm a scholar of generative art, and we've been actually making generative art for a really long time. As long as humans have had art, we've been using systems to make it. We used our hands to make stamps before we had paintbrushes. We use things like spirographs and looms to make interesting generative patterns more precisely than we could have as humans. So we've always been making kind of alien generated art. Of course, as soon as we got computers, we made even more of it. So this is Vera Molnar. She's one of the more famous people working in this space. She's been working since the mid-century. She's actually continuing to work today. She's in her late 90s. So she continues to make pieces. This is a piece that I made after one of hers. Uh, and you can see she's making like lots of different rectangles kind of displayed, displaying this like possibility space on screen. This is a bunch of my work. People who have maybe been in my classes have seen it before. Uh, I have been making generative work for about 20 years. Uh, so it's about a quarter of the total time that generative art has been made with computers. And in that time, because I've made so many, I've gotten a really good sense of a whole bunch of different ways that you can design for this. And I almost entirely design my work in a purely liquid state. I very rarely compress it into solid forms, only if I'm like going to print it on a scarf or print it out in a gallery. So the answer to the question today is gonna to be, how do we design for a liquid art space without having to compress it back into its solid form? So to do that, I'm gonna use one of my generators that I made about 10 years ago. This is a little flower generator. It works uh, on an algorithm called uh, L Systems, which is an algorithm that I teach some of my intro students here at Northwestern. It's a lot less complicated than these fancy kind of machine learned models that you hear about coming out of Google. So it's a simpler model. We can use it kind of as a metaphor for these big complicated models that we don't want to get into technically today. So let's talk about some patterns. We can reason about possibility spaces. So a possibility space is everything this generator can generate. Uh, we can reason about these possibility spaces as geometric spaces. So I'm gonna get a little bit mathy, but feel free to just look at the pretty pictures. So the first thing we can do is a collage. We saw this actually before with the Vera Molnar piece, where she had a whole bunch of rectangles. You saw like a big grid of those rectangles and you got a sense of like, okay, I think I can know looking at this, the sort of possibility space of her rectangle generator. I feel like I, I know what this thing can generate. So you're looking at this, you can get a kind of good sense of what my little flower generator can generate. It generates a bunch of little branchy plants. Some of them are branchier than others. Some of them have thicker branches or thinner branches or different colored leaves or different colored flowers. Uh, so you say, okay, at a glance, I can understand what's in this space. That's pretty handy. I can have as many different samples. These are all random samples from this space. I can have as many samples as I want. Um, but the important thing to note, one of many important things to note here is that this space is actually much bigger. So the space has probably trillions of different plants in it. Not that they're all like perceptively different, um, but it has mathematically trillions of different plants. But I feel like from just this slice of, you know, a couple hundred, I still get a sense of what's going on here. Now, it's important to note that this works really well for things that are graphical, that I can kind of glance at and get a sense of what it looks like. This does not work for certain kinds of linear media, so if I have a novel generator and I make a collage out of 200 novels, you cannot glance at that and get a sense of the expressive range of this possible, like uh, expressive range of this generator. Expressive range is the kind of things that it has. Uh, so the mathy bit is, now I can imagine this generator and you could say, okay, what if I have two parameters on this generator and I map those to X and Y coordinates. And now I have, I can imagine a whole bunch of different little points in this space and each of those points has an X and Y coordinate. I can say, okay, for this X and Y coordinate, grow this flower. For this X and Y coordinate, grow that flower. And I can imagine two different flowers coming out of that. Now I can imagine that I can sample any single point in this space and have flowers in it. So now I can talk about my art spatially. So here it is in three dimensions. Uh, unfortunately, if I'm gonna talk my art, about my art as an n-dimensional cube, I have to have as many dimensions as the generator has variables. My little flower generator has about 20 parameters, so it's a 20-dimensional cube. Uh, I can just barely think about three. Four is pretty much out for me. I definitely can't do 20. Things like mid-journey have in the thousands. I definitely can't think about a thousand-dimensional cube. But if I use this as a metaphor, I can say, okay, I do know that I'm at a point in space, and I can reason about that. So one neat thing that we can do about this is we can think about the points as moving over time. So this is 
uh, and you can imagine my 20 dimensional cube, I take a two dimensional slice and I kind of move that slice through the cube over time. And then I'm illustrating up here. Why does it look like it's animating? So one neat property is if you have two points that are quite close together and you say, okay, keep moving that point, keep moving that point, keep moving that point. I imagine that my art will change each time I move it, but that nearby points are gonna create nearby arts. And I can use that to trick your eye into perceiving a bunch of different arts shown frame by frame as an animation, as one single art that's shifting over time. So that's kind of a neat freebie. So that was about things that we can do mathematically in this space. Now I can talk about exploring a space as a communal activity. What is it to kind of socially engage with these generators? We're seeing this a lot, like on Twitter, when you see a lot of people kind of posting different generative art that they're making. This seems to be one of our most powerful patterns, is just people talking about the stuff that they find in these spaces. So here's my space again. Uh, we can imagine that some spaces have lots of different stuff in them. So their possibility space is huge. Sometimes it's got lots of good stuff, sometimes it's got lots of bad stuff, sometimes it's almost all bad stuff and a couple of good things. I can imagine finding something in the space. I've gone exploring the space. I found something neat, or maybe I found something terrible, but I want to share it with my friends. There's a very human instinct, which is that I want to name that. I want to give it a name that says that I've seen it, and then I want to kind of put my name underneath it. So you end up having people kind of annotating this space. People end up finding good stuff in this space, this huge space, and saving it as landmarks. Not only do they save it as landmarks, they actually make weird little collections. So if anybody has a Pinterest board and you have a whole bunch of different weird little Pinterest boards, you know that people make collections for all kinds of different things. They co make collections of things that they think are good, things that they think are bad, things that tell stories, things that just kind of have some weird theme in common, and then they use those to kind of tell stories back and forth to each other. This is actually really sy like symbiotic for the person who made this generator. Because if you think about it, I'm a person who made a generator. I made my flower app or something similar. I could bring you in and show you a random flower from this generator. Maybe that flower is good, maybe it's not. But if instead your friend says, hey, I've made a landmark, this is my favorite flower, I've sent it to you in a text message as a link, you click on that, now you enter the space not only at a thing that your friend thinks is good, but at a thing that has social and emotional value to you. So it's great as an app you developer, I'm bringing people in in kind of the nicest possible way. We can actually map this, we can say, okay, this is the journey that people take as they're exploring the space, the landmarks that they create, and then how other people come in at their landmarks and start exploring their, on their own. So we've turned this big sea, this big empty sea, into actually a big structure, a big town that people are kind of building roads and tours through. We're building up this big rhizomatic structure of how people have explored the space. So we can use each other's landmarks as our own starting off spots. We can actually do a neat thing where for anything that somebody has found, we can trace back this lineage. This is actually a pattern that we've seen in a couple of different uh, apps like this. You can trace back the lineage to say like, all right, who did I start off from? Well, who did they start off from? And I can kind of trace back. And again, it's really nice. Everybody feels like they're kind of being given kudos for exploring the space. Everybody feels like they're part of the community and the community is valuing them. And again, great for the app developer. And give credit to the explorers who came before. So, our third and final pattern is we're gonna talk about how we explore a space kind of as ourselves. So we talked about mathematically how do we explore this space, we talked about how do we explore this space as a community. Now we can talk about how am I sitting down going to explore this space. So we can talk about two kinds of people, surfers and seekers. So seekers are people who are kind of invested in art as a noun. They're, in, they're looking for a solid piece of art somewhere in this liquid space. So they think that they want an orange flower with green uh, leaves or something like that. And they might say, okay, well, first off, is this thing that I'm looking for even in this space? Like, is this in the expressive range of the generator? And maybe I'll use a, my collage to see that, or maybe I'll browse a whole bunch of different lists and see if anybody has a list that I think would contain it. Um, so I'm trying to say like, okay, is it in here? Maybe if I'm looking for a photorealistic plant, maybe I think that that's not in there. But if I'm looking for an orange plant, even though I don't see an orange plant on here, I'm gonna kind of guess that I think an orange plant is in here somewhere. Um, so now how do I actually get to this like position in n-dimensional space that I think contains my plant? So one thing that you can do because we're in an n-dimensional cube is you can actually set up a whole bunch of sliders. So one slider for each dimension. You can imagine this as an n-dimensional etch-a-sketch we say, okay, some in this direction, some in this direction, some in this direction, some in this direction, kind of navigating in 20 different dimensions. 
Um, this is good for precision, but it's often not kind of easy to jump around the space. We actually have this other way that uh, is really a recent invention. This is the idea that we have what's called a vector encoding. The idea that I can learn an association between the English text, a lime green tree with orange flowers extra bushy, and some point in the space. So if you say a green tree extra orange, I can kind of interpret that and figure out like the correct space to jump you to. So I can jump directly to the space just by using natural language. So we can also go back to all of our nice annotations that our community made and say, okay, there's a whole bunch of landmarks. None of those landmarks are exactly what I wanted. I can explore the space around them, or I can actually do some silly math tricks. So I can breed together two different parts of the space. I can say, okay, here's the mommy plant, and here's the daddy plant, and halfway in the middle is, I think, the thing that I want. Or maybe like 75% towards the mommy plant. Or maybe I need to like bring in another parent and kind of like, all right, I'm gonna move this way towards this plant, and this way towards this plant, a little way towards this plant. So I'm using all these landmarks to kind of navigate relatively. Now we can also think about our surfers. Our surfers, instead of our seekers, are the people who are not here for a piece of solid art. They're here to explore the liquid space in its fully liquid state. They're here for a verb. They're here to move, not to get an individual noun. They're often here kind of to have a conversation with the space. So we notice how often we have kind of these models set up as conversations, even like things like ChatGPT or MidJourney, which is part of a Discord. They're set up as like a chat app. Why aren't they set up as a chat app? It's because a lot of times people figure out what they want through having a conversation. So I might say, okay, I'm gonna start with one piece somewhere, this is a point somewhere in my space, and then I illustrate uh, the space around that. So give me, here's a point, give me a bunch of points around that point, and then I jump to one of those, that becomes a new center. So I'm always kind of going relative to where I started. I call this mutant shopping. I actually show this at parties, uh, so I'll have this on the big screen. And then people, as they like, can select flowers, select a flower after that. There's kind of like a no thoughts, just vibes. They're just like looking for the one that catches their attention in the moment. They're not going anywhere in particular. So this is really neat because sometimes we actually like forget about the whole possibility space and we're just living in the moment. We forget about what we're looking for. We're just exploring for the pleasure of moving. This is called autotelic. Uh, that's Greek for, for its own purpose. Really fun to like people to design for when they're feeling autotelic. So the question now finally is, can we escape this Bach faucet? If there was a big red button that you could push and get a Bach music, David Cope got it, he won. Except that he didn't. He had to compress his stuff back to solid art. So here are the patterns again. And just to ask the question of, maybe not all our art has to be solid. It's great that we have some that's solid, but I think that we can learn how to swim in liquid art in all of its wonderful dimensions. So thank you for your time. <laughs>